Hello, lovely people. Welcome to your favorite show, PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight, he's an engineer, an innovator, a thought leader, and a novelist. He's the first and only Ghanaian with 22 issued US patent. His contribution to the development of computer-aided process architectural automation is incredible. In 2008, he won the first Black US Engineer Award. He also won the most promising scientist of the year 2008 and the NJ Biz Innovator Hero Award in 2008. He's 2009 finalist of the NASA Astronaut Candidate Corps, former founding dean of the School of Engineering at Ashasi University. Professor Fred Mark Bagalori, currently provost and president of the Academic City University. Good to see you. Yes, thank you. You said my name quite well. Oh, that's impressive. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> Yanni. Greetings. Okay, yes. and how do you respond to that? Yanni Biebe or Yanni. Okay, so mm. what, how have you been and what have you been up to leading uh, a tertiary education revolution, I guess? Yes, um, <laughs> I've been up to a lot of things, you know, uh, picking up a university from the ground up. Mm. Um, trying to excite students about the possibilities of the future, mm -hmm. trying to build instruments to help with the pandemic issue, um, sharing some thought leadership uh, with folks in higher ed. It's always a busy day, Aisha. It is, and of course, COVID has exposed us at the fact that uh, we lack in health facilities. Yes. But of course, you are an inventor. Yes. You are an engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you love artificial intelligence. Yes, I do. I mean, what do you do? What, what does your job entail? What do you <laughs> What do you even invent? What do I even invent? <laughs> so you know, I mean, the whole training process for an engineer is for you to unravel complexity. Mm -hmm. It's for you to tackle problems, problems that impact people's life. So where people see where people see nothing but complexity mm -hmm. and inefficiencies and frustrations, we see an opportunity to go in and say, what can I do to streamline this process? What can I do to make life a little easy for you? Okay. you know, so when kids ask me, how do you become an inventor? I just say, look around you. You know, when grandma is waking up or grandpa is standing up and they say, hmm, is there something you can do to ensure that the next time they attempt that they don't say, hmm. Okay. And that could be a beginning of something inventive. Mm. Definitely, you're going to tell me about what you do when okay. you get to uh, the lab. Fluid, fluid mechanics lab. Fluid mechanics lab. We'll yeah. go there. You show okay. me what you usually do. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in the uh, the astronaut bit. Bit, okay. What, what were you doing that really <laughs> got you to become a finalist? It's yeah. something we'll be going into. Okay, but okay. Let's get to know you, Professor yes. uh, Fred McBagolori. Okay. You're from Upper West, right? Born and bred in Accra. Parents from Upper West lived in Upper West. Both of them? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, well, Fred McBagolori was born in East Lagoon. Uh, I think that's now the fancy real estate <laughs> name for a place we call Baolishi, Baolishi, which is still very, very close and dear to my heart. Okay. Um, I grew up with two other brothers. I have an older brother and a little brother. Um, spent the most formative years of my life with my grandparents um, who had relocated to Accra at the 10, I think the early 40s mm. um, with six kids to raise. Um, believers in education, believers in discipline, um, and they always aspire for us to achieve great things. So at age six, at age six your, your parents were divorced, divorced yeah. and you had no option than no to option. live with your grandmother yeah. at Baolishi. I had options, but you know, this kind of divorce battles. <laughs> the kids really, you know, the, the interests of the kids were never on the table, right? Would you it say it people. had an impact on your growing up? Oh, ob obviously. I mean, at six, you want to be with your parents. Mm. You know, you want to be with your mom. You always dream about the day you wake up 
and somebody will come and say you are the mom or you are the dad and, and that this whole period in Baleshi was, was a mistake and Aww. somebody would just apologize and then you could move on with your life, you know, but <laughs> that never happened. Especially because you were like a dada B when, oh, yeah. when dad was around. Yes, 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 it was a good life. Life was good. Very good. Mm. You know, my dad was a, a personal assistant to the Minister for Social Welfare at the time. Okay. Uh, Kelly Ojato, who also happens to be my paternal granduncle. And so those were the days where they would travel to Paris and come and we had nice clothes and we have tricycles no. and, and then um, to transition all of a sudden within a short period of time from a tricycle <laughs> to creating your own uh, <laughs> little borrows driven scooters and running with tires with water in it and two mm. sticks on the side. You know, that was transformational. But I remember one time I was, there was this center of town okay. where adults would gather and play cards mm. um, with cashew nuts. So okay. it was a little gamble going on there. And I was sitting on this tire, one of these old lorry tires, and it was Hamatan season. I think I was white from head to tail, uh, from <laughs> head to toes. And this young man came to me and stood there and looked at me for a while. And he was the schoolmate of one of my aunts. Mm. And he just said, Fred, is that you? And that statement stuck with me all my life because it was almost like a, he was having an out-of-body experience. Mm. Like a few years ago, this was that little kid on tricycles, mm. and now he's sitting on the tie and he's white from head to toe. <laughs> toe. But here, 30, 30, 40 years, maybe 40 years later, mm. his daughter is here at Academic City University. Wow, College. it's oh. quite interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. In all of this, yeah. while you were living with grandma, yeah. where was mom? Mom then was working for WA district administration. Um, so she stayed on in WA. My mom was really young, you know, mm. I think by the time my mom was 23 years old, she had all three of us. Okay. So she, my grandparents basically took us in so that she can get a second chance at life. Yeah. So she went off and worked for White District Administration. She would come on her yearly annual visits and spend some time with us and go back. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, along the line, she remarried. Um, and the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> Let's start from the days of university staff village. Village, okay. Then to St. Louis. Greece, yeah. And then to Nandam Senior S High School, school then yeah. St. Augustine's College, okay. and then finally at the Central State, State university. university. How okay. was the experience? So, you know, we, I started school, I believe the year was 75. And we just used to walk from Baoleshi mm. all the way to University Star Village. I mean, now it takes me three minutes to drive that journey. But those days, it was all forested, really, really heavily forested. And it was a long walk. And we were about 13 students, 13 pupils that would come from that village every day and would walk in a group for safety reasons. Um, and you know, by the time we got to about class six, um, Mostly all the girls had fallen out, except my aunt. Okay. Um, and I was the only one that went to secondary school in that cohort. Wow. Yeah. And so when my grandparents passed, you know, there was this yearning to go live with mom. You know, I wanted to go back and, and just have the experience of living with a mom. So my brother and I decided to go back to, to Upper West. And... Um, of course, like, like I said, mom had her own life to worry about. So the easiest place for us to relocate was to Teza. Mm -hmm. um, who wants two screeching teenage boys after <laughs> her when she wants to <laughs> wants her own life, you know. <laughs> so we lived in Teza for about nine months. And, and then I who, went to St. Louis. You were there with who? So this was my late grandfather's younger brother. Okay. Um, he had retired. He served in the Second World War, had retired home. And my mom always felt that we needed a strong, a yep. strong man present in okay. our lives, you know, to, yep. to, to make sure we didn't go wayward. Definitely. So he was the next level of authority <laughs> that we had to deal with. So you had a little military <laughs> training. So we had a little too. military training. We, we fought him, but he won most of the fights. <laughs> <laughs> what was quite interesting was that every kid we met at our age was in secondary school. Okay. And it was so transformational because when we live in Baoleshi, everybody just wanted to finish school, become a trot driver or a mechanic <laughs> or, 
<laughs> or were missing and get married to a local girl and have plenty kids, you know. Oh, okay. So, I mean, we were guys by every definition of it. We were <laughs> guy boys, grew up in, you know, the psychology was all just, I wanted to become a mechanic. I thought that was cool. And then there was a time during the revolution where the planes <laughs> would fly over our house. I was like, wow, that is nice. I want to be a pilot, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> you know, you, you go you through all this transformation. I mean, those days we used to Because that was, that was the fita. coolest. Fita, that was the coolest job because <laughs> right behind our house was this long stretch where they would come and test drive the vehicles. And you know, those days when we're running errands, you just hold the bowl and start staring the bowl. <laughs> so I could just imagine myself in one of those cars screeching across, spinning around. Okay. And all the little girls love it. I'm like, wow, I'm going to be a hero <laughs> driving this car, you know. <laughs> it was just, I mean, they were the hottest guys in town. I went to St. Louis Prep School. Okay. Which is, was a sc small school run by the Catholic missionaries in Wa. Mm -hmm. And it was a boarding school for about 20 to 30 kids okay. and you just come in for a year ride a common entrance mm. and then you leave and then another badge will come in mm. so it was like a halfway home mm. where you got an intensive one year of really good preparation to mm. ride a common entrance so mm. i spent my one year and the same brothers actually ran nandom secondary school so naturally most of the students who go to nandom secondary school from from um, St. Louis. Mm. So that was what happened. I went there, rode the common entrance, and then went to Nandam Secondary School. Okay. So at Nandam Secondary School, mm -hmm. I believe the um, experience was phenomenal. Yes. I, look, I was so eager to go to Nandam Secondary School that I actually went to school a week before, before school opening. started. <laughs> so Tell me about I it. got there, carried my trunk. I didn't even know the bus stopped near Nandom <laughs> Secondary School because that was my first visit. Okay. So the bus stopped in Nandom Town. I got up, I carried my trunk, and I walked that three miles journey to campus, Who's to an right? empty Who? campus. Who? So you I got on campus, earlier. and I was told, school reopens in, in a week. I said, don't worry, I have enough food. Just let me into the <laughs> dormitory. <laughs> I'll wait. And the senior house master said, you know, you can, we can't leave you alone here. Yeah. So you have to find somewhere to patch until, and so school, reopens. until school reopened. I said, no, I have enough food. I can survive <laughs> here. It's no problem. I just want to get this journey going, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I carried my trunk back to Nandom Technical. Okay. And there was a young man there who used to be the gardener at St. Louis. And he had gone to Nandom Technical School. So I went to him. I said, Joe, they said I came too early. Me, I'm in a hurry. <laughs> and he said, oh, you can stay with us. So I spread my blanket in his dorm room, and I stayed there for one week and went to Nandom. Mm. I, it was a profound experience. Okay. I mean, not only was I enthusiastic about going, but I met people from all walks of life. Um, we had the rich, the less rich, the less privileged, and it was an equalizer because mm. you couldn't come there and say this was Liman's son. Liman had two children there, or Commander John's children. It mm. was such an egalitarian community that you didn't have to feel bad if you didn't have. Okay. I mean, people wore slippers to class, you know, people come in with one pair of shorts and t-shirt. Um, and that humility, yeah. you know, and of course, from that kind of environment, there's that gradient where people were working really hard to escape their circumstances. So that enthusiasm to learn, to excel, was infectious. Mm. Wow. And then um, your father died at age 11. Yes. How did, How did you know that? that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was quite interesting. So um, when my father died, of course, the last time I saw him was when I was six years old. So at 11, I hadn't seen him for more than five years. And I, I really think I was the only one among the kids who really had any image. And my mm. older brother and my brother really don't have any reference point. Mm. So I was getting ready that morning to go sell Pito. Okay. When the delegation came, your, your, your my, grandma my was grandmother selling was Pito. selling Pito, so watching. You, helping her Charlie, with those you have to do that. It wasn't yeah. help, it's a duty. <laughs> <laughs> so you you had to fulfill your part, you know. That's the that's the, that's the economic bargain. So when know? the customers come around. So the customers will come, we'll serve them, mm. um, you carry your portion and with a simple instruction, you must sell everything before you come back. Goodness. And so so you the delegation, I was going now, I was, 
Yes, go yeah, around and pass him, Abochima, Shiashi, you know, Opongulo, wherever you could go to you get those sales. You carry the pito yes, in, in what? You carry it in a little Opolu. <laughs> <laughs> Or gagba, you know. Okay, and what? <laughs> what, what, what? And in bottles, mm -hmm. you know, frothing at the end, and the flies buzzing around you with <laughs> such enthusiasm. <laughs> and how are you advertising your pito? <laughs> um, I just you just see a group of people sitting there and say, "Nyaba heko, guys, you know, you wanna <laughs> you wanna get some of this good stuff. This is from Koma, you know, the best pito." In, in the town. area, so I learned a few marketing skills from okay, that, you from know. from your grandma. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. so that was when you had the bad news. Yes, so the delegation came with my father's oldest brother, who was then a police superintendent. I think he was in Yendi at the time, and my late cousin. And I saw a long entourage of people come in, and I knew it was not good news. So obviously I overheard in the conversation that they had come to officially announce that David McBurgon Lurie, my father, was dead. And so as I was walking away, I was thinking, you know, I was just crying the whole time. Oh. <laughs> what do you do? 11-year-old boy. Yeah, I'm wondering, wow, so I will never get a chance to ask this man all the questions that I have. Mm. So even and at age six, yep. you lost, uh, I lost contact I with completely, your dad? Completely. And that certainly would have an impact. Oh, on ab absolutely. I mean, when you're a kid, what do you want the most? Your parents, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it does. I mean, it informs the relationship that I have with my children, mm. you know? It informs my interaction with them. When you come to my house, um, my kids are excited to see me come from work. Definitely. You know, and, and I tell them, you know? I'm, I'm quite frank and open about it, I tell them. I said, there was never a time in my childhood that I wasn't hungry. Yeah. <laughs> that is a fact. And then I tell them, I said, <laughs> you were always I was always hungry. hungry. And, uh, I had Why? Such, such high uh, metabolism rate that <laughs> <laughs> I was a perpetual consumer, you know, so I was always hungry. And I mean, carrying food around and walking around, it's not an easy exercise, you know. Th that engine has to be refilled each time. <laughs> And, and then I tell them, I said, look, what I miss most about not growing with my parents was the privilege of walking to an adult and saying, I'm hungry. Okay. But, I mean, after that divorce, you yeah. couldn't do that. I couldn't do that, obviously. I mean, my grandparents saved what they could afford. Yeah. You know, and if it is three meals, which, you <laughs> which was quite difficult, mm -hmm. Um, you couldn't say, um, where's the meat <laughs> or where's the beef? It's like... <laughs> Interesting. But at end. random, yeah. um, what would you describe? I'm sure you were faced with a number of obstacles. Yeah. What would you say uh, was your biggest challenge in Nandom and how yeah. did you surmount it? So in Nandom, I think climatic conditions were really rough. Mm. I mean, the Hamatan was biting. Mm. Um, <laughs> I think that's really your first introduction <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> that life is war, right? <laughs> that uh, the food was horrible. Wow. The food was actually horrible. I mean, the food was so bad that we called the dry okra soup diesel. Diesel? Diesel. And you could, it looked like diesel. And you could actually count the number, the grains of dry okra Amen. at the bottom, sitting at the bottom quietly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're wondering whether this is for human consumption. And I, look, I still don't understand why. I still don't. The food was so poor that when I went to St. Augustine's College, I thought I had died and gone to a different world and, resur and resurrected. <laughs> In a different I'm like, <laughs> students get to eat red, red and beans, <laughs> and you eat kenke with uh, red pepper, black pepper, green pepper, sardine. With some fish and Where stuff. are we? Is wow. this the same Ghana? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so at so you were yeah. eating the diesel with what? Tuozafi. Tuozafi, okay. And then... Sometimes we we'll get um, white rice with granola soup, <laughs> and uh, the only time we tasted beef was when one of those cows looked sick. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, I was, uh, true. I know my fellow Nandam said guys will not insult. They, are, they will testify to that. So anytime we see a we see a sick cow walking around, somebody will say, "Is it look like a mad cow disease?" <laughs> or 
something. But you see, it's, it's so well cooked that even if it was mad cow disease, nothing will happen. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that is true. Alive. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> beside the food, everything was fine. I don't mm. think I would have had um, a better education if I had gone anywhere else. Mm. Um, I love Nandam Secondary School uh, to death. Most of my formative years happened there. Most of the really good friends that I have in my network were people that I went to school with. Mm. Um, an, an unbelievable experience. Mm. At Nandom, yeah. were there also financial challenges? So I will come to Accra during the long holidays and do some construction. Mm -hmm. um, I will weave baskets, you know, some of my creativity uh, that eventually translated into inventions came from learning to weave baskets. And mm -hmm. these were baskets for carrying tomatoes. This mm -hmm. was long before the boxes came and basically killed that whole industry. Mm -hmm. So in Balishi, one of the core traditional artisan work was weaving baskets to support harvesting. Okay. Um, every kid at the time my age learned to weave baskets by age 10. Mm. Uh, this was before the so-called East Legon started to mushroom. Okay. So I would come weave my baskets, make a little money, do some construction. I actually used to brag that, you know, any house that was built before 1982 in East Legon, I probably worked there. <laughs> Uh, as a, a dark foundation, <laughs> I carried mortar, I mixed concrete. Look, I did everything to survive besides stealing. So you would do all those menial jobs yeah. to get something to get buy a little money, provisions. Buy some of Bruno sneakers when I show up on campus, yeah, you think yeah. Michael Jackson has arrived. <laughs> They, they, they don't know the sweat that <laughs> they has don't, gone you know, They thought that Accra boys were rich, you <laughs> know. But people were burning charcoal, selling charcoal. You know, the beauty about money is that when you have it, it doesn't tell you where it comes from, you know. <laughs> and in all of this, what, what kind of student would you say you were? Were you a box ticker, the mm -hmm. typical box ticker, mm -hmm. or a troublemaker, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the adventurous mm -hmm. student? Hmm. <laughs> That's a trick question. You have to be, <laughs> I have to be careful how I answer this. So I was a very, very studious student. Okay. Um, I wasn't your true poor type. Okay. I was always the one that needed to go to the basic, the fundamentals, mm. and to understand it. Okay. And I always saw education as an outlet, as an escape. Um, and of course, the historical burden that my grandfather was one of the first to go to school, mm. and that history has to be preserved. So I always felt the burden of history on one. And so my priority was always to get education right. Mm. Even when I went to the university, I would never go out to a nine club until my homework was done. Wow. Okay. And I think it is still the case. I'm very impatient. Um, I'm you always have to get something yes, done. I'm hungry for knowledge. I'm inquisitive. Mm. Um, so I, I, I was a little bit of a troublemaker. I mean, usually creativity comes with that, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, did a few student riots here and there. Um, okay. Nothing too bad. Mm. Um, like, don't throw people's food away. We live in the middle of nowhere. So yeah. if somebody is late to the, caf uh, the cafeteria for five minutes, why should you throw their food away? It did not make any sense. So okay. it was more of a social justice type kind of, thing. Kind of rebellion. Mm. Or you are in Form 1 and six formers call a bunch of Form 1s into a room and they are asking okay. them to go into a trunk. And I'm saying, why? Okay. You know, and they'll say, well, this was, this was done to us. I said, did mm. you like it? He mm. said, no. So why are you doing it? Mm. So those were the kinds. And of course, I'll never go into that trunk. Okay. I will fight not to go into that trunk. Okay. So that kind of rebelliousness was there. But I was always a very serious student. Mm. Is this kind of social justice fight, uh, yeah. uh, is it the one that led you to actually drop out of school for some time? <laughs> Where did you get all this information from? This is, Charlie, this is highly guarded, you know. Yeah, to, to some extent. My first real trouble was when a student was making it impossible for me, you know, to go to school. I mean, he almost ran me out of school. Okay. Until I, you know, as history teaches, when you are pushed against the wall, <laughs> you have two options. You either break or you push back. Okay. So I pushed back and, um, you know, 
it was unpleasant. You can <laughs> this cannot be repeated for TV, but you know, I'm sure if Alex you and Cancer the hell out if, of him. if Alex and Cancer is sitting somewhere, it's a memory <laughs> that we both want to forget. <laughs> No, I want to know. It's what did you it's do? A, it's a memory that no, it's a, <laughs> You showed him a little person Charlie, from the I, north. I showed him how the how how we solve battles, you know. And I think a little bit of my concomba blood had to kick in, you know. Yeah, but it was a it was a horrible scene. But <laughs> I had no option than to fight him back. Okay. Because you know, when you are hungry and you are in the afternoon session and you've walked for three miles barefooted <laughs> in the hot afternoon sun, carrying your table and chair, and somebody decides to so cross you. For your That's an act of war, you know? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> I, I, I pity that guy. Yes, I, uh, I felt bad for him, you know. I saw him many years later, and I just looked at him for a while, and I said, I wish that this had not happened. Mm. And then, on second thought, I'm like, yeah, it, it should it have happened. Good, it, happened. it had to happen. Because I wouldn't you, be sitting you felt here if liberated I felt, I felt so liberated. I didn't know what freedom felt like. Because <laughs> I used to wake up, <laughs> I used to have nightmares about this guy. You know, going to school is another day. He was bullying you. So he was bullying me. Oh, wow. He was bullying me. I mean, hazing is the word, you know. And, and from that day, I can assure you, I've never been bullied again. Well, what exactly I was fight he doing? Back. What, what was he doing to you? So I'll get into the class, class three. I'll set up my desk. He'll just walk in from his really nice khaki, <laughs> well ironed, um, you know, nice singlet. And I'm sitting down there with my, my baulishi khaki that. <laughs> The braces that we put across, I'll cut them and tie them at my, along my As waist belt. so that I can run if I, <laughs> if I was confronted with any danger. Nobody wants to be running and pulling their pants behind me. <laughs> so I'll tie it up, and then I'm sitting down here scratching my lice in my hair. He just walks in, and he comes right like this, bam, bam, <laughs> on the forehead. I'm like, what is this? You know, what kind of harassment is this? There are 20 other no kids in this class. Unprovoked aggression. Goodness. You know, so... I decided that uh, it would be time to pay back in kind. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. And I, I think I went beyond kindness, you know. And so afterwards, you so you I got arrested. I don't know if it was an arrest. So I got taken to Legon Police. Both parents were police. Oh. So they took me there and and they they asked me what happened. And I took my faith. I didn't even know there was something called faith. You know, I just decided not to speak. So my older brother goes home and gets my grandma. And my grandma was pretty tough. I think some of the aggression we have comes from. She was a very tough woman. Mm. She comes and says, what's going on here? They say, oh, your grandkid cut somebody with blade. Oof. You know, I just told you. <laughs> and um, he said, Fred, did that happen? I said, yes. <laughs> then he turned around, he looked at the guy's father and said, what did your son do to, to my, my grandson? grandson? And he couldn't explain. She just grabbed my hand and said, let's go home. And it became foolish case, you know. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you know, she repeated the same act. You know, when she first tried to enroll us, I think she tried to enroll us in 74. We went, the headmistress said there was no vacancy. So we went home and waited for a year. Then she brought us again. She said there's no vacancy. And my grandmother said, there would be. She said no. She said you create one. She said, no. My grandmother said, I will strip here if you don't admit my grandchildren. She and doesn't take no No, no. And the woman was like, you do what? And then the first cloth came Went off. Out. And she said, they are admitted. <laughs> <laughs> so th that's how I went to class one. My grandmother threatening to, to do whatever it took for us to get in. So oh, wow. Uh, yeah, she took me home. Hmm. She took me home, nothing happened again, and then I ran away from school. You know, because you go to school and they start pointing, this is the killer. They you know? were I mean, who, who was <laughs> so that kind of label? To go to I decided this whole okay. thing was a waste of time. For how long? I think it was about six months. Mm. You know, I'll dress nicely, leave home, and I just go and sit on a mango tree and eat fruits. I said, and this is, <laughs> this is an easy. I was actually going to school. So, how did you resolve this? So, uh, one of my mom's 
age mates. Actually, he grew up also in Baoluxi, mm. I mean, one near Monkote, mm. um, the former assistant headmaster academic at Presec. Okay. Um, he always, always took a liking for me when, since I was a kid, you know, when I was a kid. Mm. And so one day I saw him, he said, Fred, I haven't seen you in a while, because I used to carry his books. He was teaching then at University Star Village. I used mm -hmm. to carry his books, he said, I haven't seen you, and I said, I fled. He <laughs> said, why? I said, I don't like that place. He said, were you suspended? I said, I don't know. So one morning she came and said, we have to go to school today. So we got there, we went to the headmistress, and she said, oh, you know, I wanted to find out what's going on with Fred. Everybody is saying he's suspended. And the woman said, no, he wasn't suspended. He just disappeared. <laughs> so I went back. That's how <laughs> you went back to That's school. That's how I went back. And I just saw him not too long ago. Oh, I mean, wow. a man that made a profound difference. Uh, I think yeah. the story, the narrative yeah, would yeah. have been different without mm. Niamh mm. So mm. it's a oh, good wow. man. Oh, wow. Interesting. Good man. And so, I mean, growing up, you wanted to be a mechanic. Yes. Uh, when did the love for science, science. you know, so when did you... Mechanic is a scientist well, too. Well, yes, and yeah. I realized that mm -hmm. way somehow you yeah. did mechanic Car engineering, engineering yeah. somewhere. Actually, I actually wanted to go to medical school. Okay, that was what you wanted to yes, do. Yes, I actually, you know, along the line when this transition from a mechanic, a pilot, ended up in Nandam Secondary School, uh, what was quite interesting at the time was that all the top students went to medical school. Even mm -hmm. those that would do physics, chemistry, math, yep. uh, like the Dakubo brothers, mm -hmm. would still go to medical school. Okay. So I went to St. Augustine specifically because at the time St. Augustine was producing some of the, the in terms of numbers mm -hmm. per school, mm -hmm. St. Augustine was sending a lot more students to medical school. Okay. So one afternoon, I got a letter, EMS, and from my mom, and she said, oh, I, I overheard on the radio that you've been nominated for Head of State Award. So you need to go to scholarship secretariat and find out what was going on. Mm. So I went to Accra. I came to Accra. I was then in Cape Coast, obviously. Came to Accra. And then I went to scholarship secretariat and said, oh, yes, you've been nominated, but you need to come back here and take an exam. So I did. And then I got nominated. 1991 Head of State Award. Mm. So then they gave me all these forms to go home and fill, fill out. So I went and I filled pre-med, you know. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And then I brought a form, the lady looks at it, looks, looks at me in the face and said, <laughs> did you know this scholarship was for engineers only? Oh. And I said, uh, I didn't know. She said, do you still want to go? <laughs> and I'm like, of course, why not? <laughs> I mean, this, you're talking about America, you know. <laughs> Everybody's in trouble about America. I mean, I'll go there and do dancing, why not? You know? so, <laughs> So that's how I ended up an engineer. An engineer. Oh, I mean, wow. I had opportunities there to actually change. Mm. Um, that's how flexible that system is. Okay. Two of my colleagues eventually went to medical school. Mm. But after the first year, I really found a calling. And then mm. I said, this is really, I mean, think about it. We still don't have counselors in yeah. high schools. Yeah. If we are all medical doctors, who is even going to build the equipment mm -hmm. for the medical doctors? Mm. But as fate will have it, yep. I spent 16 years of my career entirely in biomedical, building equipment and instruments to support doctors. Wow. So there was medicine in my destiny, but yeah. not working. Mm. In fact, I actually said, look, if I had become a doctor, <laughs> I probably would, would have been some miserable district director in some village somewhere, <laughs> moaning. <laughs> you know, I enjoy what I'm doing more. Care of patients. <laughs> I could have, but I've, I think I've done, you know, the beauty about engineering is that if we make a mistake, thousands of people die. Yeah. If a doctor makes a mistake, only one person dies. Yeah. Mm. So it's a profound profession that mm. cuts across every facet of life, mm. and it's more exciting. It's more exciting. It's more exciting. Professor Fred Mark Baganlori, he's my guest tonight. He wanted to be a mechanic, he wanted to go to medical school, but he ended up being an engineer. Now he is an inventor. He enjoys what he does. Don't forget, he's also contributed immensely to the development of computer-aided access design and automation. And he's authored nine books, yes, right? Yes, nine novels. Nine novels. Yeah. When I return from this break, he will be delving into his career as an engineer. What does he do after a hard day's work? He would also be telling us about 
family values and lifestyle. All of that after this break. Welcome back to PM Personality Profile. My guest is still uh, Professor Fred Makbagalori. He is the Provost and President of the Academic City University. Prof, let's talk about your career, especially your contribution uh, mm -hmm. to the development of computer-aided um, process design. Uh, the process. design. You know, I've always been lucky enough to find myself um, places, uh, in places in my career where new things are happening, new challenges. Um, that either people are hesitating or people really need go-getters mm -hmm. to step in. Mm -hmm. So my first career was with Siemens, um, okay. the global conglomerate mm -hmm. um, in the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. And the task I was given basically is to take a process that had traditionally been a manual process. Mm -hmm. you know? So if you needed a hearing instrument, which most of us will start appreciating soon, these are mini computers in your ears okay. that help you to hear. Mm -hmm especially when you're getting older and you're losing your, your hearing. Yeah. Um, and the challenge was that these things were always made manually. Mm -hmm. uh, manually means that if you order a hearing instrument, it will take you up to sometimes six months before you could get it. Okay. So you'll be waiting for it. And the task I was simply given was, how do you cut down that time? That was the challenge. Mm -hmm. So my job was now to go out there and look for technologies that we could put together to automate that process. And so you're looking at 3D scanning. Today, people, everybody talk about 3D scanning. You know, 20 years ago, the, the technology was nowhere near that. Mm. Then you have 3D modeling software, and then you have 3D printers. Now people have them at home. My kids have a 3D printer at home. Mm. 20 years ago, you couldn't even dare dream about it. Yeah. So my job was to scout for these technologies, put them together, mm. and to reduce the process of making an, a hearing instrument mm. from six months to about 24 hours. Okay. You could order an instrument and get it within 24 hours. Mm. And then, of course, with these technologies, we could also develop devices that you couldn't do before, doing manually. So one of my first inventions, obviously, was that if you are 60, 70 years old, and your hands are shaking. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult for you to even tune your hearing instrument. Yeah. So our job was to give you a remote control mm -hmm. that you could use to program one mm -hmm. hearing instrument, mm -hmm. and then it will synchronize with the other hearing instrument. Okay. And then sometimes when you wear hearing instruments, because its job is to kind of elevate the sound for perception, if you drop a glass, for instance, all of a sudden, that impulse, you can hear it loud, you know? Mm -hmm. So even kids that have hearing problems, if you drop something really hard, you see they'll cover their ears. Yeah. So we develop technology so that you can recognize that this is an impulse sound, and then you trim it down so that the person doesn't hear it loudly. Okay. Now, to do that, you need to have a wireless coil mm. inside the hearing instrument. Mm. And for a very long time, when we put the instruments we were designing into a dummy, like a human head, mm. everything works fine. But when you put them into the human ear, some people would not be able to perceive that sound. Okay. And so we discovered that the human e ear canals do not actually point to each other. Oh, wow. Okay. So human anatomy is not symmetrical. If you draw a line from across your nose down, this part of your body doesn't always look like the other part. There are differences. Okay. And so that led us to being able to actually develop instruments that people could wear mm. and be able to synchronize them. Okay. So, that was a fundamental, and to do that, you know, you have to develop the 3D scanning technology mm. because it was primitive. Mm. You have to develop the 3D modeling mm. software itself. It yeah. was primitive, and then the printing technologies were primitive, mm. and putting the three, to get the three together even made it much more primitive. Mm. And so most of the technologies that I developed was an attempt to sanitize each separately, but also to be able to put them together into a system that allows you to achieve a 24-hour turnaround. Mm. And then also, to add to that, because it took so long to make these, by the time you actually get your instruments, sometimes it is loose. So 25% of all orders that will come in will come back for remake. Mm. And we were able to reduce that to less than 3%. Mm. COVID 
uh, came in mm -hmm. and actually exposed us, for instance, as a country. Mm -hmm. And I know many other countries have had their own yes, problems with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, mm -hmm. you came in with uh, mm -hmm. a ventilator Later. project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where are we with that now? Well, we are at a point where we can give it to Kolibu. Okay. To yeah. test drive for us. Um, when we developed the prototype, I got asked quite often, you know, when is the product going to be ready? When is the product going to be mm. ready? And as a product developer, you know, working for Fortune 500 companies, you know, projects like this will not take you less than four or five years mm. to bring a product like that to mm -hmm. the marketplace. Yep. And I think we've done it in about a year and a half, okay. which is quite, mm. quite profound. Mm. So we have a system, even the one we had at that, at that time, yeah could have been put on a person that needed it, mm. you know. But we needed to take it from that prototype and really make it product product ready to go into a hospital. So when are you um, having that... Uh, that Kolebu interaction, interaction? Where my so. dean of engineering is talking to them. Um, they were here about a year ago to see what we were doing. Mm. Um, now we actually, we confidently have a product that we can put in their hands and mm. say, try this for us, give us some feedback, and then from them, we take it to Ghana Standard Authority. Mm. And that's it. You know, and if, if this were in the U.S. and you're at the peak of COVID, the FDA will give you a temporary approval to actually roll it you out. You definitely you know. need to roll this out. But that is not the COVID challenge. It's not over. The challenge really is, over. after I have gone through this using my own resources and contributions from individuals, mm. then what? What next? What next? Is government... Um, you know, helping in this project? Have you had any where engagement? Is, where is government? <laughs> where is government? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, and, and for you, what would be the biggest reform with regards to university Cities. education? So I think the biggest thing is for us, this generation and the generation ahead of us, to psychologically reconfigure ourselves that the educational system that we crave too much and hack too much wasn't the best. Mm. I think we are still in denial. Okay. We need to get over that phase. Mm. That's one. I also think we need that mental revolution, you know, that still informs us that this generation of students are not brilliant. Mm -hmm. They are not hardworking. They are not like us. Uh, we did A-levels. We did, look, Knowledge is not supposed to be hard to get. Mm -hmm. These kids are just different. These kids are bored. These kids don't want you to stand in front of the classroom and lecture them. Mm -hmm. That's old stuff. Yeah. They don't want you to tell them unanswered stories. Mm -hmm. um, they want to touch stuff. They want to build stuff. They want to break stuff. They mm -hmm. want to question you. Mm -hmm. So we need to accept this new reality. Mm -hmm. It is only by stepping out of our own comfort zones that we can begin to change the narrative. Mm. Universities are formed by people. They mm. are formed by mindsets. Mm. And we have to break ourselves out of that mold. Okay. I think it's more psychologically, more psychological mm. than changing the curriculum in itself. Mm. You know? Talking about kids, let me ask you, which yeah. among your kids, how many of them? I have three girls. Three girls? Yes. You are a strong <laughs> man. <laughs> you have a I'm gun. A stress man. Have you bought a gun already? Uh, well, I'm on national <laughs> TV, I can't say. <laughs> Because you would have a lot to deal with. Um, which among them is towing your line? Oh boy, um, I think they all are. They all are I scientists. Think they are all scientists. Oh. I think they are all scientists. Uh, the oldest there. one wants to be an engineer. Hmm. The second one wants to be a veterinary doctor, but this morning she says she wants to be a, bio a biomedical engineer. Oh. And the little one always wanted to be a computer engineer. Ooh. She's already doing some animation stuff. You've so. infected all of them. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> it's, they say girls usually inherit their father's brains. That's very true. And, and hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Prof, uh, I must say we are so proud of you, you. Uh, for the Thank good you. work you're doing there. I'm, I'm sure the family is also proud of you, yeah, your wife and the kids. They don't tell me that enough. But they don't do? <laughs> but what's your relationship no, are, with your kids? I mean, my, my kids what kind are, of a father are you? Um, I try to be the best father. My kids will tell you I'm the best father in the world, which, okay. which, which may be true. <laughs> but my middle daughter was actually quite um, 
enthused by the ventilator project. Okay. There was no day, and there's still no day she would ask. She wouldn't ask about it. How? how even far this morning, are you? she said, "Dad, is your ventilator ready yet?" Wow. So if I have a government like my daughter, <laughs> I'll move the whole world. <laughs> you know, I'm not a dad that when you hear his the sound of his car, you're gonna run into the washroom and throw out. Okay. Okay. I am the type of dad that when you hear my car, you want to actually come and take my bag. Okay. <laughs> I am the type of dad that when I'm eating, it's okay for you to come and snack around my food. Mm. Um, I'm the kind of dad that would eat and take my own bowls into the kitchen and wash it. Okay. Um, I'm the kind of dad that wants to drop my kids in school every day by myself. Wow. Um, I'm the kind of guy that, that will ask them, how I am doing as a father. Oh, really? And what I can do differently. To improve. Yeah. And so... <laughs> they have what, the opportunity to assess yes, you. Yes, they assess me. They, they rate me, you know. And there's always feedback, you know. <laughs> feedback like we don't like the way you react when you see moldy food in the fridge. Okay. And I say, yes, I'm happy you don't because that can kill all of us. Yes. So don't leave your leftovers in the fridge for too long. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, there is time to be a father. Mm -hmm. Definitely I'm not their best friend. Mm -hmm. I'm their father first, um, <laughs> which means that uh, you have we have to draw the line right. sometimes, but it's a democratic atmosphere. Mm, they can walk to you and say, they Daddy, can walk to me. this, no, 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 I don't agree yes, with you. Yes, and they can say today that, is today your, um, what do they call it, the, the third one, your giving day or something like that. <laughs> your yes day. So today is your yes day. I said, what does that mean? It means anything we ask for, you, you say, say yes. yes. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Today is my giving day, which means I just given you 200 and it is enough. <laughs> Oh, that's quite interesting. Uh, but of course, I must say you look very fit. Um, what do you do to keep fit? <laughs> You know, I, I love to walk. I think that's probably the only exercise that I really mm. enjoy. And if there is something that I miss the most about the U.S. was the availability of spaces where you could walk. Mm. You could walk any time of the day. Mm. Um, here, the only place I can walk is to park my car at Ayi Mensa mm. and go up to Paduasi. Okay. Anywhere else, some trotters will kill you or some <laughs> Okada guys will kill you. <laughs> that is really what I miss the most. Um, <laughs> But that you mentioned is a walk. It's a good nine kilometer yeah. up and up and back, and mm. um, I do that. But then during the rainy season, it's not easy to do. Yeah. So then you 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 fall back a little bit. But walking for me is the ultimate cardio physical exercise. Yeah. But I see that you are often very busy. Do you have some time left for family? Do you even have a leisure time? What do you do with it? Actually, you, do? you know, I. I'm actually much more busier in Ghana than I was in the U.S. because I used to wow. write a novel every year. Mm, okay. You know, and I can tell you in the six years I've been home, I've only finished one. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> between the traffic, you know, the dust, you know, it's, it's been difficult. But um, I like to write. You do. Uh, my creative outlet is really writing. I, I, like, I like imagery. Mm. I... I like the human experience, okay. you know. I, I always say that if I didn't write, I'll be at Ankafo. <laughs> <laughs> That's my outlet. Or oh, Pantan. Pantan is much closer to my house. <laughs> the, the brain will be so congested. It's vibrating. So you needed to need take an outlet. some out. <laughs> yes, I like to write. I like to read. So you have nine publications. Nine novels. To your, to your credit. Yeah. Okay. What, what really uh, motivates you mm -hmm. to, write to write all those novels? So look, I think um, my grandparents were really great storytellers, okay. profound storytellers mm. about, you know, from everything from slavery, from ancestors escaping slavery, fighting slavers, um, the journey to the south, um, where we came from, who we are. Mm. Um, so these stories from my childhood played a pivotal role in that. Um, and I read a lot also, right? And I'm just a student of nature. Mm. I, I, I always have this conflict in my head between mm. the strong and the weak. Okay. 
and that forms the basis of my thesis. Okay. You know, there's always an individual in my book fighting the establishment, mm. pushing the establishment back, challenging the status quo, um, and that that keeps me really going. And, and you know, and the beauty about writing is, think about it, Aisha, you can create your own world. You can make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. All the streets can be lined with gold and diamond. You can make people fall in love. You mm -hmm. can make them unfall in love. Okay. You can kill them. You can <laughs> resurrect them. I mean, where else do you get such, a, such power than in writing? In you know? writing. <laughs> wow. Is that also what informs the genre of music you listen to? So it does. And, and by the way, you know, people talk about STEM, but it's actually STEAM. Because the creativity itself is in the arts. Okay. So you can't decouple them. I mean, look at what we are doing right now. We're having an interview and see the amount of technology. Yeah. That is here, right? Mm -hmm. That is that technology that brings the artistic nature of this conversation to a broader audience and gives life to it. Mm -hmm. And so you can't separate the A from the STEM. Okay. You actually need it. So that's what I do. One mm -hmm. side is arts. The other side is STEM. Okay. Uh, music, I just love good music. Definitely. Every, you know, um, I don't mind the genre. It's like, it's like, you know, it's the African body is such that when you hear certain tones, the body naturally moves according to it. Mm -hmm. Whether you know the culture or whether you understand the words or not. Okay. The soul understands the soul. music. He who does not love music is not fit to live. So um, do you have a favorite? Yes, I love um, Endless Love, Diana Ross and Lionel Richie. Hmm. It's a beautiful song. I like uh, Mr. Big. Mr. Okay. Big is one of my favorite musicians of all time and that's soft rock. Um, you know, I'm the one that I want to be with you. A beautiful song, profound. Don't tell me you are playing that. Is it the flat? Show me what she's done to me. Spider, little girl. Broken heart, don't feel that bad. When it's true, it's true. Make a twist of both of you. Come on, baby, come on over. Let me be the one to show you. The one who wants to be with you. Deep inside, I hope you feel it too. Just to be the next to be. We can be together, baby. Uh huh. I can, I can make you start to smile. Good stuff. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Professor Fred Mark Bagonlori, my guest tonight, thank you so much for um, allowing us into your life. We really appreciate the good work that you're doing. Keep up the good work and keep training a lot more people who will also step into your shoes when you are no more. Thank Viewers, thank you so much for watching. Same time next week, we'll be bringing you another edition of PM Personality Profile. But don't forget, we'll be going to the laboratory with Professor Fred McBagalori to show us some of the equipment he works with. And I get the privilege to work with a professor. <laughs>
okay. and you can go out for lunch and come and it's ready. Oh wow, okay. okay. Now this is a, a lead machine. Mm -hmm. You can make parts, mostly cylindrical parts here. Mm -hmm. And when we go out, I'll show you the manual version that has been used since the 1800s. <laughs> and nobody can throw those away because they still work okay. as the beauty of engineering. So I if you see. look inside, you know, you'll be able to mill parts like this. Mm -hmm. you know. Okay. And you can actually see a part in there. Yeah. Already. This is a, a bike, an electric bike that our students are working on. So you see the batteries there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a new trend, right? I like to ride my bicycle mechanical. You don't have to apply the pedals, right? I haven't ridden it yet. You can just sit on it and don't let it jump out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Electronic bicycle. Yeah. See that? Okay, so once you press this, it, it will take you wherever. Yeah. You don't need to you control need to, it, you don't with need to control this. it with this. The oh, these are some of the things that won you the awards we've been talking yes, about in absolutely. 2008. Absolutely. You won the what? I was Black Engineer of the Year, most promising scientist. Mm -hmm. um, the same good year, I went on the New Jersey Innovator Hero Award. Yeah. And then I rode that all the way to the 2009 NASA Astronaut Candidate Corps. I'm particularly in interested in, in, that. in that. You should be, because yesterday I was just watching, I was just reading the new group. Uh -huh. There were 12,000 people applied and only 10 got selected. Wow. In my year, we were 4,000. Goodness. And only 47 people became finalists. And you were among And I was among the 47. The 47. Wow. It's and a great from guy. a record perspective, first timers, only 0.1% of people who attempt the first time ever Get make it to, to finalists. The finalist. And so you were there. I was there. That at was the first try. Was first, first try. Oh, I went wow. through phase one and phase two, and I sat on the same chair that Nels Armstrong sat in when he was, he was interviewed to go to the moon. <laughs> um, it's, it's the world's toughest job interview. Yeah. The world's toughest job interview because there was everything there. You, I mean, they will, they will bring you into a room and you see your own heart up there on the screen beating, and then they will slice it open. And then they will measure the thickness of your heart walls. Goodness. Heart walls. Yes. They will measure the density of your bones. Um, essentially, they look into every hole in your body. Let me put it that way. Um, you went through all of that. Yes. And then twice during the, so the, when you became a, a, a semi-finalist, you actually go in and you sit on that chair and you have like 20 astronauts all dressed in, in the blue tracks. Yeah sitting in there and they just grill you like, like, nobody's, like, like business. nobody's business and you know you I walk will. away and then they ask you to come back and you're like again <laughs> you know <laughs> it's so intimidating <laughs> But it was uh, an experience. Oh, yeah. Just being a finalist yes. is enough. It is. It is. I mean, from Nanbok yes. Secondary School <laughs> to <laughs> you know, John Space Center. With all the diesel mm -hmm. and you know, all that here in my life. My ancestors would not have dared to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my father. Thank you, Professor Bacalori. And viewers, thank you so much. We're going straight to the uh, park. We're going to have a walk with Professor, and remember I told you, maybe, who knows, I'll be on my way to becoming a Professor. So, how often do you do this? I try to walk twice a week at least, during twice. the weekdays and okay. then on the weekend, so three times a week. Three times a week. Yeah. How long do you walk or how far do you walk? So I walk about nine kilometers. That's from Ayi Mensa barrier up the mountain to Peduasi Valley and mm -hmm. back. Okay. That's 12 kilometers. Wow. Yeah. Oh my God. Sprint, sprint, sprint. Challenge the run faster than you. Where's my water? 
goodness. Give me my water. <laughs> Give me my water. Give me my water. My water. <laughs>